can't believe we spoke to Sean Tucker. I, I'm going to kick things off with a question that I'm pretty sure you've never been asked. And if you have, I don't care because I've not heard the answer. Mm -hmm. So I know that you've mentioned a couple of times randomly how many steps you've done in a day on various photo walks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But do you do you go out and go, I'm going to do 30,000 steps a day and try and get a couple of good photos? Or do you just generally happen to do that many steps whilst on a photo walk? <laughs> It started like just, it was an accident. Like you look at the end of the day and go, holy crap, that's how far I've walked in a day. Um, but I, I the, through through lockdown and everything, like or when things started to come out of lockdown and we were allowed to go out and exercise and we were allowed to run around a bit. Um, in London, I lived just over the common from Joshua Jackson, who you might know, he's a fellow street photographer. Um, and we're good mates. And we just decided we were going to we didn't really want to go, it, things were opening up now, we could go outside and, and, and everything, but we didn't really want to go on public transport. So we thought, what if we just walk into London from Wandsworth, uh, yeah. walk around and then walk back. Um, and then we got back the one day and realized, oh gosh, we did like, like 20 kilometers today. What if we could do 30? And then it became yeah. a little bit of a like, let's push ourselves, yeah, see yeah. how far we can get. And that's where like the, the, the steps and stuff started racking up. So yeah, it was definitely for photography. But it was nice because like we had this little fun game on the side that pushed us to go a little bit further. Yeah, yeah. And when you go a little bit further, you walk around the corner and you do find the better photographs because yeah. it also forces you to stop walking the same routes as well. Yeah, so tack on some extra mileage. So half a game and half, yeah, half it did help with the photography. Yeah. It's almost like a, like a little secret challenge that no one knows about unless you <laughs> kind of know what you've done. But it's, it's quite funny you say that because me and Luke actually went to London a well, how long ago was it? About a month or so ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and we were even talking about you and Joshua because, mm -hmm. in a way, we kind of felt like you two. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because we're not from London, right? So mm -hmm. when you go on those, we, we walked everywhere. Didn't we? we actually went to a concert in the evening, but we went there for the day. Mm -hmm. But we didn't get the tube once, did we? No, we no, exactly. Everywhere. And we just walked everywhere. But we're it's too much. Like there's so much stopping and starting when we're doing it. And I'm like, I can't take a photo and have a conversation at the same time my brain just kind of shuts down. So I'm like, we'll walk a few steps. I'm like, I need to tell you something. That's how I say what I've got to say. And then I can, then we can carry on going. So we were yeah. like taking us about two hours to get what would normally be like a 15 minute walk. Yeah. You get, you get like a nice rhythm when you go out with mates shooting, don't you? Like it's sort of, you flow in and out of conversation, shooting, conversation, shooting, but the more you do it with somebody, you kind of learn each other's rhythms. And yeah. you also learn like what attracts your mate in terms of visually um, like when, when Josh and I would walk around, we'd round a corner and, oh, that's a Josh shot. So I, I'd, you know, step aside, do his thing. And I'd sort of check my phone or, or, or answer an email or something and he'd do his thing. And then when he's done, we kind of like carry on chatting and walk on and we'll round the corner. He goes, you want that shadow, don't you? I'm like, no, I'm yeah. all right. <laughs> you know, like we kind of know. And you, the conversation kind of ebbs and flows, but it's super natural because we kind of know each other really well. And it's, it's, it's really comfortable hanging out with a mate like that when you know each other's sort of preferences. You're not stepping on each other's toes photographically, which is nice. Yeah, I, th I think we do that all the time. There's times where I've stopped and said, Luke, that's one for you. And the yeah. same as you, I'll just get my phone out, check it or whatever it might be. Because I know Luke's going to take a photo or I'll turn around and he's already taken the photo and I've been talking to myself for 10 seconds. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that kind of thing. <laughs> but I think that's the important, like not necessarily important because it's just as fun to go out on your own as it is with people. Yeah. But it's almost like a different experience when you're like with one person, same as it is when you're with lots of people, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I definitely like, you know, if I go out on a photo walk with anyone, whether it be Luke or someone else, there's also like a sense of confidence as well. Do you know what I mean? Because mm. you're not like this scared person who's just like, oh, I, there's a photo I want to take, but I'm a bit, but when you're with someone, you, you kind of don't even think because you're in the middle of a conversation and then you just stop to take a photo, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was interesting reading in your book about the, like the find your Doug um, <laughs> section, because that was when I read that, I was like, oh, that's Jamie, Jamie is mm -hmm. my Doug. And I am. Um, <laughs> jamie's doug because we do absolutely do that like i'll send jamie like edits or crops or um what you know should i use color or black and white for this image i can't decide mm -hmm. all those kind of questions because i'm just like i know i trust i trust his judgment and i trust that he will give me an honest um he doesn't go yeah that's cool that's a nice picture well done um he'll, he'll give me a genuine answer 
Um, and that was really interesting to read that and that that, that was like a, mm. something that you would suggest yeah. photographers do. Um, yeah, we, we were actually trying to work out as well because like myself and Luke, we actually used to work together a fair few years back and we kind of didn't know that each other liked photography. Mm -hmm. It was something we did, but it wasn't really spoken about, right? Because we worked in an office together. We, used to, we worked for like this event company. Um, and yeah, it wasn't till like we both left the company. I, you know, I left to go traveling, which actually is quite a funny story. When I left, I, I left to go traveling. I went around Asia with my, with my girlfriend. And when I came back, we weren't quite ready to come home, but we were done with Asia. Mm -hmm. And we actually rented out a camper van and drove through Spain and Portugal. Mm. and you happened to be there Sean in Portugal I don't know if you remember mm. Mm. and you put out a, 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 whatever it was on social media saying I'm going to do a photo walk in I think it was Lisbon I th I'm oh, pretty yeah, sure yeah, yeah. when I was doing the film with Martin Rott yeah yeah and I missed you by one day uh, but it's quite funny because I well because I was driving through uh, like I even said to my miss at the time I was like I, can we turn around and go back to Lisbon but <laughs> no, I was too far gone I was too far gone but through that I actually bought one of Martin Watts prints and ah, cool. I've spoke to him a few times since then. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, his work just amazed. But yeah, I, you know, I had a, I had a chat with Martin. He's a really nice guy. I think he was doing an exhibition at the time. This was mm. like pre lockdown and stuff, but um, it's quite funny because me and Luke were trying to work out who introduced yourself to, to us, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean? But I think it was kind of like, you were kind of like the first person that we, we both knew and we weren't introduced to by one or the other. Do you right, know what I mean? Right. Cool. Um, like because obviously since we we talk a lot and it's like oh do you know this person or have you seen this person but you were kind of like the first mutual ground almost and cool. it's quite it's quite strange to think that because i used to work in wandsworth and lived in battersea mm -hmm. and i used to that was kind of when i started getting into photography and um it's quite a few years ago now i um bought a camera and just went out in the street because i was like well where else am i going to use this thing and didn't realize what I was doing was actually uh, street photography. And someone bought me a book of street photography. And at the time, I think I wasn't really ready to realize what I was doing was a thing. And it kind of, I was like, I'm not interested in that. I'm just going to go out and do what I do. And now I really like, I like looking at the book and there's a lot of like great street photographers in there. And I used to go into central London and be like, this is the sort of things I want to take. There's lots of people I feel quite anonymous. And when I'd walk around Wandsworth at lunchtime, I was like, this is terrible. I hate it. There's nothing here. Mm -hmm. And then when I left there and I went and worked for a company, I kind of didn't do much photography for a while. Started working somewhere. It was in a barn in the middle of a field and got back into street photography. And that's when I discovered you and was like, you, how okay it's all these pictures from Wandsworth I was totally missing what was there before and now all I've got are trees fields and I'm going to go out at every lunchtime and take these photographs mm. but it was not until I kind of stepped away from it that um you kind of realized what you were missing um so like I guess if you I mean clearly not because you've been posting a lot of work since you've moved but did you have like a difficult transition period at all when you moved away from London not really. I think because I I I I'd anticipated it before it happened. I knew I was moving. I knew I knew before lockdown. So I knew for two years that I was coming up here. It was just the the kind of details of it, like where was I going to get a place? Where was I going to move to? Um, and I already started long before I moved. I started to shoot, and some people pick this up. Started to shoot more on the common, more in the parks, more outside than on the street with the hard angles and shadows. Um, I'd already started to transition because I knew what was coming and I wanted to sort of practice that style of photography, but also set like a bit of a visual expectation for people, this is where I'm going. So it wasn't too bad. No, I mean, I, it's, I still don't know what I'm doing. Like I'm, I'm still up here, like I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just running around. I think you have to- um, that's, that's, that's the challenge at the moment. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a script for video at the moment about moving and about photographing in a new place. And I think one of the big things is being patient with yourself. Like you can't arrive somewhere new and take great photographs on day one. It's, it's an unreasonable expectation. You have to suck for a while to, to, to spend time, to look, to, to drive around, to see what's there, to take a load of bad photographs going, well, this is just standard rubbish to find 
the few little ones and then go on. Oh, I need to remember that there's something about that. Then you build on those. That's like the process of a few years. So mm. I'm not too hard on myself about the fact that I need to produce like this, this brand new view of Yorkshire when there are photographers up here who've been doing it for two decades and are struggling. I've got a long way to go and that's fine. That's the way it should be. It's, mm. it's social media that puts the expectation that I have to come up with bangers every week. I don't put that on myself. I don't care. Like it's just taking it little bit by little bit. And um, I think if you've got that patience, you don't have to worry about the transition. You just have to be patient and let that transition come. If you've got some kind of photography skill, if you've got some kind of eye and you, you, you know how to notice things, hopefully in your way as well, then wherever you go in the world, you should be able to over time produce decent sets of images. It's just how much time it takes. I think, it's, I think that's really true, like, especially in the fact like when I think about it compared to like putting your own work out, you know, whether it be a book or a zine or whatever, you know, not social media, basically, prints, whatever. Mm. I remember, you know, a fair few years ago, I was like, I've took a lot of photos. I'm happy with a lot of those photos, you, you know, you know, a handful of them or whatever it might be. But I was, I was happy with the work I, I was kind of producing, if, if that makes sense. Mm. And I was like, I could put, I could put a, book, a book together with my favourite photos, no problem. And I didn't. And now I look back and I'm like, there's no way, there's no way I've got anything close to putting a book together. There's photos that I like. There's there's images that I have that I like. And, you know, maybe I'd sell them as a print or, you know, they'll be saved for a future project. But there's no way I've got the work in place to put a book together. And that kind of makes me think about, you know, your move to Yorkshire and your next book that's coming out, which I'm assuming is going to come out, by the way, I'm guessing there's going to be a collection five. Um, at the printers at the moment, yeah. Oh, really? Oh, there you yeah. go then. <laughs> Keep secret. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and it makes me think, like, it's quite exciting to know what's going to be in that because I know that, you know, your book is... Uh, me and Luke often say this, like, you use social media like a scrapbook, right? Mm. And that really resonates with the two of us to the point where we kind of do that, I, I think. Mm maybe more so after knowing that other people use it in the same way. It's not just for bangers. It's not just for no. the best of the best. If anything, we shy away from putting our best work on there because there's this fear that you don't want it to go out and it be unnoticed. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. When really it is a scrapbook. It, it, it's, it's for you, not, not anyone else. If people, people like it, then so be it. But I don't know I, I didn't really have a question there. I was just kind of uh, just replying to what you were saying, I guess. But um, yeah, I, I feel like it's important just to kind of be yourself. But I'm in the same boat as you in that I don't feel like I could put a book of photography out either, like a proper monographed hardcover book. I've been shooting for 15 years. I still don't have a set of images that I would go, this is my book of photography, cloth bound, hard covered project. I just don't have it. And, and that's that's my own fault because I have been messing around on Instagram doing scrapbook stuff and I have been traveling around trying a lot of different things and I have been like my my job has been product photography mostly that's not going in a book it's boring crap if I'm honest like so e even though like I think photographers want to rush to the book as well what those those collections I put out every year are more like annual zines yeah, yeah. It's, it's not like like my photography book this represents portfolio worthy images it's more like this is the best of what I saw in a year so even 15 years down the track for me, I'm still a long way off putting a book together as well. And, and I think photographers, it's good to kind of set your expectations about how long those sort of things take, you know, and how deliberate you have to be. I'm just, just starting now to look around for that long-term project that might turn into a book, but it's super early days. And that's me, even at this stage, I think people get this idea that, oh, you've got lots of followers online. You must be a big name photographer. I feel like a baby photographer who's just maybe becoming an adolescent, thinking about becoming an adult. In a lot of ways, I, I haven't taken those big steps yet. I'm still moving towards it slowly. I'm not rushing myself. I'm trying to do it properly, but it, it does take time, yeah. I, I suppose I suppose when you think about it like that as well, like, like you said, you can look back in 15 years and you can go, this is what I saw in 2022 or yeah. 2019, whatever it might be, which is, which is great to have. But do you ever feel like you struggle to put that workload together in a year because i know that you take a lot of photos right mm. but do you feel the pressure of putting x amount into a book or because so i know like, how you put the book together sort of thing but yeah it kind of like struggle? it motivates me because i know i set myself yeah. targets so i know that i want to post a photograph to instagram every day 
And that's just, that's just a target I set myself to keep myself shooting. They can't be good every day because I'm not good enough. I don't have the kind of hit rate that says I can produce a brilliant image every day. I don't know a photographer who has that hit rate. No. But, but at least if I set myself that goal, it means I have to go a few times a week to shoot something that I think is interesting enough to show people. So yeah. that means that I'm taking, I don't know, 10,000 photographs in a year that get whittled down to 365 sort of interesting photographs that I can show on social media in a scrapbook form that I can then take hopefully 90 of the best of those to put into those collections. So it's kind of a funnel that gets whittled down 10,365 to 90, 45 color, 45 black and white. It gives me kind of targets to say, I can't sit at home just watching Netflix because like if I don't go out and shoot a lot, I don't have a lot to choose from. So for example, for collection five, I've got it on my desktop here. I've got, I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm gonna check. I've got uh, 590 images, which I placed in that folder that are the better images from that year. Some of them went on Instagram, some of them didn't. But from those 590, I have to find 90 that are strong enough to go in that collection. Not to go on my website as a portfolio, not to go in a cloth bound monograph, but just good enough to go in that collection and sequence them in a way that shows what I saw that year and, and pairs interesting photos together. Yeah. And the more I shoot, the stronger the book is every year. So it gives me that motivation to make sure that I'm photographing as much as possible. So just to clarify then, we need to do 30,000 steps a day, take 20,000 photos yep. and have one photo a day to be on your track. That's it. Yeah, easy. Well, it's, 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 easy. It's, What's everyone doing? Exactly. I mean, it's 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 it is. It's 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 walk a lot, see a lot of things, take a ton of photographs. It's the only way to get better. I think everyone's looking for kind of the magic bullet. You know, if I get this set of presets or that lens, I promise you, if you only ever use your phone, go look at Dmitry Markov on Instagram. Like, um, he is. Um, I think it's his account is DCIM. Dot RU, I think Russian photographer only shoots on his phone, shoots incredible documentary stuff around Russia. Just a, a monster photographer only uses his iPhone. It's, yeah. it's nothing else other than he walks a long way. He sees a lot of things. He takes a ton of photographs and produces amazing stuff. That's the only trick. It's the only trick there is, yeah. is, is shoot a lot. It's quite funny to say that because we actually had a guest on our podcast. Um, he's actually a friend of ours from Northampton, where we're from, called Josh Astrop. Mm. And he's a, what we always joke about, I think we've said it a few times to be fair, he, he's the best non-photographer photographer. photographer. Yeah. But like you said in your book, right, define what a photographer is. If you take photos, therefore you are a photographer. Mm. Right? Yeah. But he only takes photos on his phone. He had a, his own gallery just because, you know, friend of a friend ended up owning the gallery and he put some work together. And it was amazing. It wasn't just like he looked out and got a slot. His work's amazing. And everything is just cropped exactly like you would take it on, on his phone, mm -hmm. all black and white, because that's what he likes. Um, and it's amazing. It's amazing to see that someone can do that and they don't feel the pressure of, oh, I haven't got this camera or I'm not using whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it's good to see that that someone isn't scared to put that out do you ever feel do you ever feel um like i suppose it could work both ways do you ever find it hard to put the camera down or hard to pick the camera up uh putting the camera down is easy yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah there are days definitely where, where I'm, i don't feel motivated to pick it up um yeah. the way i trick myself into it though is i just tell myself i'm going for a walk because i always enjoy a walk mm -hmm. and i tell myself i don't have to take the camera out if i don't see anything and there's no way I'm getting to the end of the walk without taking the camera. It will always happen. But just to get yourself in that mindset, I'm just going to go get some fresh air. I don't have to shoot anything. And that's the nice thing about these little Ricoh cameras I shoot with. They're, it doesn't feel like you're carrying a camera. It sits in your, in your jacket pocket. It doesn't feel like anything. So you can just go and just go for a nice walk. Listen to a podcast. Take, take a bit of time for yourself. I can always do that. And then by the time walking around, I go, oh, that's amazing. I wish I had my, oh, hang on, I do. And then you can pull your camera out and start shooting. Like that's, that's kind of the way I get around it. But if I sit there and go, gosh, I need to take photographs. Yeah, I, I get what everyone else gets, which is like, oh gosh, but I don't want to. And there's pressure to make it good and all the rest of it. Yeah, so just trick yourself into it, I think is the, the key. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what, like, I, I've had a Rico GR2 now for mm. maybe maybe four years, uh, or th maybe three years. Um, and I, I love it. Um, I've actually recently kind of haven't used it as much, I guess, but... Um, but I, for, for like reasons, like you said, is it is just there's no reason not to have it on you at all times, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And how long have you had yours, Luke? I had it a year, and I uh, I just bought it because I found one a really battered one going quite cheaply, and it was the camera everybody was using. And I thought I just want to see what the hype is, or like if I like using it or whatever. And if I don't, I'll I'll sell it on. And I do still have it. I don't love it. I'd like the it's like the results are obviously great, but it's not. I don't really like the way it looks. I'm not quite used to the way it functions. But that's because it's not my main camera so it's kind of it's quite different to like the fuji that i use on a daily basis because it's just all the settings are in different places so it's a bit of a you, you haven't got the muscle memory and all that kind of thing that kind of what you were saying and then kind of talking about the rico actually kind of reminds me of something that i actually made a note of in your book but in your collection four book mm. Go buy this if you're listening. <laughs> listening there, to there aren't any left. They're gone. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's none left. Yeah. So you know I was actually trying to get collection two, but I can't, I can't get it. Yeah. Right. Um, but you put a, you obviously the, the book's full of great photos, right? But there's a, one of your quotes in there that says, "If you're bored, if you're bored of learning fancy techniques, it might be time to ask yourself what uh, what you want to point those techniques at. What do you really want to say?" And that kind of that that kind of got me thinking about how I am as a photographer and how everyone is uh, as a photographer and how everyone's individual. So yeah, we might all like street photography. We might all like portrait photography. We might hate landscape photography, whatever it might be, but I guarantee we all take photos in different ways. And I'm kind of finding it hard at the moment because obviously we're trying to promote front and do these things to kind of help that. But at the same time, when it comes to my own personal photography, I really just need a camera with me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because the results are going to be, what I've taken a photo of and yeah, I can be disheartened by the results or happy with the results, but does it really matter what anyone else thinks? Because I'm, I'm taking a photo of something that I found interest of. And we, we talk about that quite a lot, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And there was, um, there was a quote in the book that you from like Gary Wanagrand about, uh, I've written it down. Like I don't have anything to say in any picture, my only interest in photography and see what something looks like as a photograph. And that, when I read that, I was like, yeah, I love it. That's what I kind of want to do all the time. Where I live it, at the moment, it's not like the most interesting stuff to go out and take photos of. It's very, to you. not a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's not a lot around here. I know if somebody else came in, they would find things. But on a daily basis, there's not a lot around and there's not a lot of places you can walk to. But I just enjoy going out and like framing a photograph and pressing the button like it just that like clicking a clicking a shutter and posting them on instagram and then i don't really care what anyone else thinks and that was quite um that really resonated with me that quote and it was it was interesting at the same time as reading your book i was reading another book by um a woman called michaela cole and she has a phrase in there where she talks about the mean finding the meaning in the meaningless which I thought right. was quite a nice like juxtaposition yeah. to this like this yeah. meaning in the making book I'm reading. And then when I read that quote, I was like, exactly that, that like it's just weird serendipitous stuff that happens where you know you read a book and you read another one and they seem to be linked together for no apparent reason or for a very specific reason. But you know why would they have been? But that quote is like really. I think it's great for anybody like starting out in photography or starting out in street photography. It being, you know, it's not talking about gear or having like great equipment or any of that stuff. And again, when I started, I had a cheap DSLR. It was like the most impractical street photography camera, but that's what I wanted to go and uh, that's what I wanted to do. And that was, I didn't really realize other cameras existed. I was like, if you want a decent camera, that's what you have to buy. Mm -hmm. That comes across in your work as well at the moment with posting anything. And, you know, you said about like people have told you, uh, you know, you've lost it or, um, you know, because it's not the work that they want to see. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really love that kind of that message of like, just take take a photo of whatever you want to take a picture of and move on with your life. It's the only way you find new stuff, isn't it? Like it's, if, if you, I mean, I know what I need to do. I could probably do that every day. I know what I need to do to get people on Instagram excited. 
Mm. If I just walk around cities and photograph diagonal shadows on walls, people go nuts. Like that's that's the exciting thing to them. But honestly, it's really not a hard thing to do. Mm. Wait for someone to walk past it, get them half in light, half in shadow. Everyone will go mental. But actually, what have I done? Have I said anything? Not really. And and I don't. I can do that any day now in any city on a sunny day. I want more tricks in my toolbox than that. So I, I need to make sure that I'm shooting a ton of other stuff as well. So I'm always learning new tricks. So no matter where you drop me in the world, not just in a big metropolis on a sunny day, if you drop me in the middle of the desert on a cloudy day, I can do something interesting, which means that I have to photograph anything wherever I am and find the interesting stuff in the, in the things that people walk past and mm -hmm. don't take notice of. If I can teach myself to do that, I'm bulletproof. It doesn't matter where you put me on the globe. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm slowly trying to train myself. Don't get stuck on the on the one trick that works. Is I think the big, the big yeah. thing. I suppose it's important to be influenced by whatever may be influencing you, but try not to copy that. I guess like don't be afraid to just do what do what you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. And like you said, you, you'll go home and you'll upload your images and you'll look through them and you might go, these are all terrible, or you might find a few gems in there that, mm -hmm. that you like for, for no reason that you like them. Yeah. And yeah, it's great to discover and connect with other like-minded people but you should still always be an individual right yeah and, and and don't listen to the crowd because i mean i i the my friends who are the photographers i really respect who i know are like top of their game friends like joshua who walk around i know like he is a far better photographer than i will ever be and we've compared notes on like the stuff that we shoot and the, the number of photographers i've had this conversation with and we've said something like isn't it funny how when you post a great image on Instagram, no one gets it. But when you post something that you know is kind of rubbish and just feeding the crowd, everyone goes nuts. As a beginner photographer, you've, you've got to start to learn that. It, it's fine at the beginning to get excited because you've got more likes on a particular image, but you have to grow out of that at some stage and realize that all you're doing then is feeding the general crowd who interact with each other as they flick through stuff. So it's attention grabbing stuff. There can't be any nuance on a tiny phone screen that you're noticing. It's just the quick, big shapes, big shadows, big faces, those things people will like and move on. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a great photograph. Sometimes great photographs are, are ones that you, you, you have to look for a second and then you're surprised by something. Something like that is never gonna work well on Instagram. Mm. So you have to learn to like stop listening to the crowd and trust your gut about what the great photographs are and let the likes go, who cares? Because you're, you're, you're trying to build something deeper than social media success. You want images that you produce to work amazing as, as big prints in a gallery yeah. or, or, or in books where people spend time with them. That's, that's better photography always. And that's, that's the direction we all want to go. So at some point we have to set our priorities. So we're not just trying to feed those, the, the, the crowd and the likes and all that social media stuff. Yeah. There's something that you said a couple of years ago now, maybe, maybe even longer. I don't even know. I might've just stumbled it from an old video. And me and Luke have actually mentioned it a few times. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to quote it word for word just because I can't remember it, but it is something along the lines of you'd rather have 100 true fans than 10,000, you know. Yeah. Fans, you know I mean, and it's so true. Do you know what I mean? Like, I would rather have one comment, positive or negative, on any photo of someone's true opinion than I would 10 comments of people going, this is amazing. Well, well, why is it amazing? Do you know what I mean? And and I, I I know I'm guilty of doing the same thing. Sometimes I'll put a comment, and I think it's because I'm more conscious about it. Like, what does a like do? Yeah, a like mm -hmm. lets someone know that you've liked something. Great, but then leaving a comment, and I'm guilty for it. Sometimes I'll leave a comment saying I really like this, or I'll, you know, I really like how you've framed the photo, or I like the colours, I like the film stock, whatever it might be. And I kind of leave it there when I could take that extra 10 seconds and write just another sentence, which might kind of explain why I like that, if that makes sense. I guess we're all guilty of that. Yeah. And that, that quote comes, it's not actually mine. It's from a guy named Kevin Kelly, who wrote an article called a thousand true fans, where he talks about um, the fact that artists, I think assume, especially in our social media age, that you need millions of fans to make a living. And his argument is no, you need, you probably only need a thousand. And that's, that's not meant to be taken too literally that number, but you probably only need a thousand. If you get a thousand people who are willing to buy your book when they put it out, buy prints, come out into a workshop that you're doing, listen to a talk you're doing, buy whatever merch you're putting out there, you can probably support yourself. So the trick is not to look at that inflated 
number of followers or subscribers you have, the trick is to work out how big is that core who really care about what you're doing enough to support you as an artist. And if you're building that kind of depth, I think that's what sustains you. And I think it's not even a stable percentage. You could have 2 million subscribers and not have a thousand true fans. But equally, you could have 1,500 subscribers and have those 1,000 true fans. So it's about how, how solid and engaged can you make that core of people who follow what you do, not how big can you inflate that subscriber number, because we all know it's fake. Like, I might have, I think I just crossed over half a million subscribers on YouTube, and everyone, everyone goes, oh, my God, that's amazing. Yeah, but look at the numbers. Like, when I, when I post videos, they only get about 40,000, 50,000 views which means that 90% of my audience once hit the subscribe button and then left and forgot about me. They don't care. They're not true fans. And I should ignore that, 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 that half a million subscriber number isn't really real. That just says how many people once hit the subscribe button and moved on. That, that doesn't mean anything to me. What matters to me is how many people are still there, still following along, still listening, still engaged, because those are the people that I care about. That's my community. That's who I talk to. And, and reframing that kind of stuff, I think, is important. Yeah, yeah I guess we're, we're kind of like, a, obviously, a few stages back to, towards kind of your success, if you like. But, you know, we've started kind of making videos and doing these podcasts, which we actually, we love. Yeah, we love, we love the podcast more than anything. It's the first thing we started doing in terms of any kind of promotion towards what we're building. Um, but when I look at Instagram, again, I, I, sorry, Instagram, when I look at the YouTube kind of analytics page, the mm. only reason I go on there is to look at the engagement side of things. Mm -hmm. because that's, that is important feedback to me. If we put out a 15 minute video and people are watching it for 10 minutes, mm -hmm. I feel like that's a really good thing. Yeah. To, to keep someone's attention for that long, mm -hmm. I, I feel like a sense of achievement. When we put out a video that's 10 minutes long, but people are only watching two minutes, I'm like, that's what's wrong with this video. How can I learn from that? I don't care if it gets, I don't care if it went viral, do you know what I mean? Well, mm. I wouldn't mind it, but I don't really care, do you know what I mean? Mm. Mm. Engagement is way more important to, to, to myself and Luke than anything else. And I think if you stay on that, and so many people say to us like, oh, you know, why don't you just do a video about this? And I'm like, it's been done. I can send you a link of someone who's done it really well, actually. Yeah. Like, what's, or, or people like, one of our like one of our ambassadors, Bray Hunziker, yeah? From day one, he's always said to us, just be yourself. And I'm like, I'm, I'm a bit of a geek and Luke's quite quiet. And he's like, yeah, but you're quite funny when you do that. And I'm like, yeah. well, yeah, we'll continue to do that then. Do you know what I mean? It's the best bit of advice we've ever had, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think there's an opposite as well because um, I only realised yesterday, I went to refresh myself with one of your videos and realised I wasn't actually subscribed to you on YouTube, even though I've been watching your videos for four years. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, that's really weird. Unless I've randomly hit it by some point, at some point. But... YouTube to me, I don't often go and subscribe to people because you watch one video and yeah. then you just get this feed of like, here's their new video without ever thinking that you need to hit that button. So it is like you say, it's yeah. a fake number um, one way or the other. I suppose it's good to like show people who maybe want to give you money to advertise stuff. But yeah, it's good that, for sponsors. Yeah, but, yeah, exactly. But they still want to see views, not subscribers. Yeah. But, and, and by the way, that what I've just said to you about like just having 10%, that's true of any big channel. If you go to bigger channels, I mean, go to Peter McKinnon. Yeah. I think he's got 5 million subscribers. Yeah. He'll only have between 250 and 500,000 views on a video. It's the same for all of us. Yeah. And I think any of us who are sort of in that world, we know, don't take the subscriber number seriously. Just make videos for that core audience. You know? And I think that goes for anywhere you are on that journey. The sooner you get that into your head, the stronger it'll be because you won't chase that inflated imaginary number it won't support you yeah not the important thing i wanted to ask about the book in terms of like i've seen on social media a lot of people saying um like you know thank you for writing the book and like giving you sort of good feedback and things like that which obviously great to receive but i did wonder is there like what what's changed for you when in, in writing the book and like what have you learned i'm assuming you learned things whilst writing the book i mean not in a way like i mean the book came around in kind of a weird way because it was literally the week before we went into lockdown this u.s publisher rocky nook mm. the two guys who run that were in london for the london book fair 
And uh, they got off the plane, got to the hotel and got a phone call saying the book fair is closed down because of COVID and we're going into lockdown. So they're stuck in a hotel. They've made this trip from San Francisco and now they can't do anything. So they called me and said, hey, do you want to talk about this book? We're here. We've got nothing to do but time now. So I went along and had a drink with them. And um, I said, I know I have I had sketched out this idea for a book a while ago, just like chapter outlines and some ideas. I said, this is the book I want to do. It was slightly outside of what they normally do. They're more tutorially books that they publish. Mm. Um, so this wasn't, this was kind of new for them. And I just said, look, this is the book I want to write. So it's either a yes or a no for me, because I'm quite happy to self-publish it on my end. Um, you make more money self-publishing anyway. Um, and they said no to their credit. They said, no, well, we, we'd, we'd like to work with you on that. So um, yeah, we uh, started work on it. I, I basically took from, I think we sort of done the deal and the contract and whatever by June. So I took from June, we'd been in lockdown a month or two, June until January the following year. So about seven months, six, seven months to write it. But I guess writing it for me was like, it, it was kind of like, I, I put out videos all the time, but I, I don't get to say everything I want to say in a video because a video is a very specific format and YouTube is a very specific platform that doesn't want you to waffle on for hours. And I waffle on already. So it's like, how, how, how can I say stuff that I want to say in the way that I want to say it if it's not in a video? And this was like, no, here I get to say, I get to pick every word and I get to tell my story better and I more fully and I get to explore ideas much deeper than I could in a video. So that's kind of where it came from. Um, and it was, it was almost like just putting stuff down that had been swimming around in my head for five years. Uh, and it, it was kind of like exercising it. Like it was always in my head buzzing around. I just got to write it down, you know, put it in, in, in a hard format and put it out into the world and go, okay, great. Now I can move on and start thinking some new stuff. So it was like cleaning my mental closet a little bit, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, it's nice to have it out there, but it, again, like it was, that was a slightly weird circumstance as well, because like I said, I finished writing it in the January, middle, middle of January. And then my whole life, like went to crap because uh, my wife left very suddenly didn't explain why I just bailed I had to move house in like three months because I'd already put a deposit down on a place up here so I had to move anyway and I still wanted to move so it was like you know my primary relationship had collapsed I have to move house to a completely new part of the world all these things were happening while this thing was going through like copy editing and design and layout and printing and there were loads of issues with all those things it eventually came out in August by the time organists came around, I'd almost forgotten I'd written a book. That's how much stuff had happened in my life. And I'm like, oh, grief. I had to reread my own book because then I had to do a bunch of interviews on podcasts and everything else about the book. And I had to remind myself what I'd written. And it was a weird, that was a weird experience because it was almost like reading my own thoughts back to me and a lot of change for me very quickly. Yeah. And it was a good test. Like, does this advice still hold up? You know, with all these changes that have happened to me, does this still make sense now? And I, I, I remember specifically reading the shadows chapter in the book, having gone through some pretty dark shadows in the first half of that year. And, um, and also, like, while I was staying in York for a while, before I moved into this house I'm in now, I, I'd gone to counseling a little bit as well with somebody just to sort of process everything that happened, lots of changes. And even though I wasn't falling apart, I knew there was stuff I shouldn't sweep under the carpet and needed to talk to somebody about. And so just doing a whole deconstruction about everything that come before. And I read that shadows chapter and it was really cathartic. Cause I'm like, yes, like that, that made sense to me before, but people could argue, well, you hadn't been through all this now. And now I have, and now all this new bout of like painful stuff. And I'm like, yes, even more so. And it was, it was really affirming. Like I, I remember reading it, having a little cry going like, yes, that's still as true, maybe more now. And it was like reading a book as if I hadn't written it in a way. So like for all those things, it was, that was a really interesting experience. And now that it's out there in the world and I'm getting feedback from other people and it's connecting with them, like there's nothing more affirming for that. It doesn't matter what you do, making anything and putting it out in the world and have people say, yes, wow, that, like, that really hits me. I mean, that's the best compliment you can get really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, it's such a natural extension of like all the, the videos that you make, which, um, occurred to me as I started reading it but before I was almost a bit like what and what is this book because it's almost like a, a self-help book for photographers um <laughs> but like do you know how you do, how do you categorize it I mean 
so when people ask me about it I, I talk about it like it's my creative philosophy okay but the danger with saying that is it sounds pretentious it sounds like super ivory tower thinking and philosophy must be complicated but i think that's a misunderstanding of what philosophy is like philosophy that's, that's kind of the definition of you know judging a book by its cover right until you kind of yeah explain. But it, but but even the word, I mean, it just means a lover of wisdom. That's what philosophy means in the Greek. And I mean, like the, I mean, Socrates, who's like a famous philosopher, right? He was put to death in Athens for corrupting the youth of Athens, which means that he was standing on the streets, not talking to old, clever people who had multiple degrees. He was talking to kids, like teenagers, the youth of Athens. So whatever he was saying that was philosophy that we now put on this pedestal was so simple and understandable that even kids could understand it, and they were worried about that. And I think for me to say this is my creative philosophy, it just means like these are the things I've learned along the way that have really helped me not go down a rabbit hole of self-hate or self-doubt or, or envy of other creators or hitting creative blocks all the time or whatever it is. These are the, these are the practical things I've learned from my story as I've gone along that I think will help you as well. So yes, it's philosophy. Um, and, I, and I actually think like the, the kind of self-help label, what, what we usually talk about with self-help, I think we just, we, a lot of that is philosophy too, actually. It's just, it feels a bit pretentious to call it that, but it's all the same stuff. It's it's how do we talk about life in a way that I can give you some of my story and tell you the things that I've learned in the help in the hopes that it helps you learn some things about yourself as well and handle situations better going forward. That's all philosophy really is, you know. I mean, it's what the Stoics were doing. It's what it's what they all did. It's just you know this 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 happened to me this week. This was really tough. This is what I tried to help. This is what so and so psychologist said in the past. This is what this philosopher thought. This is something I read from some spiritual leader somewhere and i try to put that into practice and it really helped because of these things like that's good philosophy and yeah it's self-help philosophy whatever you want to call it like it's just trying to describe life that i've lived up to now and then pull in a bunch of those other theories as well to, to kind of layer on top because i i didn't come up with these ideas like these are all ideas that i've tried out that really worked and here they are for you and you can do what you like with them now you know and hopefully they help you and by the sound of it i mean the feedback i get is there are at least a bunch of people out there who I hear from who really has helped. And that's, that's great. It helps to be open-minded as well, doesn't it? Like, you know, in terms of everything that you kind of absorb, you can kind of think about it from both sides, I guess, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I've just thought of this in my head as you were kind of saying that and how you said, you know, you had to kind of go back and read your own book and you were kind of like a bit anxious about it or, you know, you can't always remember it. Do you ever have the same with, with photos? Like, because I, I guess it was quite nice to go back and read the book because it didn't all happen within a couple of months and, you know, it wasn't fresh. It, it wasn't as fresh, so you needed that kind of recap. And I'm guessing, you know, that's why you post stuff to Instagram, right? You have a photo every day and then you can look back at that year and you can pick your top 90 and, you know, do the do the intricate part from there, right? Mm. Do you ever go back even further than that and look at, look, you know, I'm not saying pick up your old book, but do you ever pick up and look, sorry, do you ever look at old photos from... That, that kind of didn't make the cut, so to speak. And do they ever feel different to you looking back years later? Do you know what I mean? I mean, I do every now and again for, for different reasons. And now I'm trying to put together a series on portrait retouching. So I'm going back yeah. and picking out old portraits and I'm posting old portraits to Instagram at the moment because I haven't really posted much of that stuff. So for specific reasons every now and again, but generally I don't really, I'm not sure why. I, I kind of like... I kind of just like to keep moving forward with photographs. I don't like to go back too much. It's, it's not that I don't like it. It's just that I don't think to do it because I probably assume most of it's rubbish. And when I do go and check, I'm usually proved right. You know what I mean? Like there's not, I'm not leaving like these beautiful gems on the floor back there. Usually I, I, I kind of know, and I've got a little folder that I'll sort of keep the better stuff as years go on. So I know the better stuff's in there. And I, I very rarely find something that like, oh gosh, that definitely should have been in that folder. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm usually right with the first the first round of judging it um, but yeah every now and again and it's just fun to see the progress I think more than like um, finding those those like undiscovered bangers or anything it's more like celebrating the progress you've made that's that's where it's cool it's like oh I have actually learned some things as I've gone along I would never do that now for these reasons and I'm better for it like that's always good yeah yeah that's good it was really interesting going to ask like if you were going to write another book or even if you were going to um write 
book a completely different one is in like non-fiction because you know you're, you there is a lot of storytelling in the book and there's a lot of um of that in your videos as well and as I was reading the book I was like would that be an interesting thing like to read a Sean Tucker fiction book no. <laughs> you've definitely never been asked that <laughs> no no I I mean I I have thought about that before uh but i i have thought about writing short stories mm. um that was an idea i had and i did start sketching ideas out for that but not yet and i i have i have sketched out recently it's got nothing to do with my channel of photography or even creativity really a book on human beings and relationships mm. um that i think might be quite interesting but again like i'm I, i'm in no rush for that because i feel like i mean i did this isn't actually the first book i've written i wrote one 10 years ago when I left the church about my time with the church and why I left and wasn't going back. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like I needed to do 10 years of living before I could write this one. You know, I think, I think I'm not an author first and foremost. And so when, when, you know, I can't, I can't sit and hammer out a book a year. I don't have a book worth of interesting stuff to say every year. So I feel like it's fine to sketch out the ideas and then do a bit of living and see how that coalesces or how the thinking changes or if it crystallizes and then, maybe start plugging away at it then, but I'm, I'm definitely not in any rush. It really is like, like bleeding onto the page, writing a book. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not lucky to repeat it super fast. No. I, had a, I had a bit of a question about kind of your process, if you like, and that's, uh, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that you've not been asked it too many times, but um, when, you know, when your process of making a video, your, your videos always come across quite calm. And I think from that, I, I, I feel like I learn from them. It's not just, it is enjoyable to watch. It's enjoyable to see your results and your work and, you know, find out about other photographers and more like-minded people, whatever it might be, but your videos are quite calming. And I don't know if that's because of your kind of history in the church or your background, or are there just outtakes where you're going mad swearing and we just don't see it? <laughs> because I have, you know, maybe, maybe because we're newer to this year, the videos that we make, we have 25 takes for something that just shouldn't take that long and then you just over it. So yeah, that was my question. Are there outtakes that we just, is there another Agreed. side to Sean Tucker that we don't see? <laughs> Not really, no. I mean, I, I've kind of like, I've kind of got a system that works when it comes to video specifically. So I've talked about it in a video before, but I, I, I script out what I'm gonna say. And, and this does come from working in the church, actually. I, I script out what I'm gonna say and I use that script when I film, but only as much as like, I don't use it word for word at all, because I, I would just feel like I'm reading or I've memorized something. So I have it like in these paragraphs and I'll read a paragraph and then I'll just put the paper down and say that to camera two or three times. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't have to remember every word. That's not the point. In fact, if I'm doing that, I'm making a mistake. What I'm trying to do is just remember the gist about where does that paragraph start? What's the thought? And where am I kind of ending? And then you can hopefully feel like the video is prepared, but also see me thinking about the wording as I'm saying it, which makes it feel more real and conversational. So I start to pick my way through those sentences. Um, so it's kind of, for me, a good balance of being prepared, but also just saying it, you know, and I, I no, I don't get too frustrated. I don't, I mean, I've kind of done it long enough now. That's where, that's where the church was really helpful because yeah, yeah. I, I had to learn how to speak in public. Yeah. And I think learning to do that really prepared me for doing videos although i'll be honest i find speaking to a camera harder than speaking to a thousand people i would rather speak to a thousand people in a room any day you get an instant reaction don't you but where it's a video you yeah. don't know it's good bad ugly whatever do you know what i mean and you overthink every every phrasing of every word which you don't do in front of a crowd because you know they don't care and they're moving on with you which they also do in a video but you overthink it more so yeah, no, I'm, 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 it, it doesn't take me too long to do now. And I've, I've got a system that works enough. I haven't like smashed any cameras or broken any lights or anything. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was the case. So I just, I was quite intrigued to ask because, you know, especially as like you said earlier about, you know, creating good content or whatever it might be when, um, you know, a lot of people put in like B-roll or, you know, mm -hmm. comical things that happen, but yours is very to the point. And I, I, I like that, do you know what I mean? Because I feel like I'm learning as well as enjoying. Um, and I also wanted to kind of talk about, you know, like your recent series, well, I wouldn't even say recent anymore, but your recent, more recent work of um, talking to other photographers or artists and kind mm. of making films about them. I also think that 
And I can only, I, I feel like me and Luca are in a good position to kind of say this because we've now experienced it. You always have a pattern. You were like, well, is that kind of how Sean Tucker is portraying them or whoever is portraying them when a video is made like that? Or is that how they are? Mm. But I wanted to give you credit because we actually reached out to Tiffany Rubert after yeah. the video tour and she actually came on our podcast. Mm. Um, and, you know, we've kept in contact. We, we talked to her, you know, often enough, she, you know, here and there. And she is exactly like she was in your video. Mm. She's awesome. And it made me just think, well, now I want to meet everyone that's in your videos. Do you know what I mean? Because it's true to, I feel like it was so true to how she is in real life. Yeah. How you portrayed in your video. Is that something you're aiming to do when you're making those videos to keep it as true as possible? Or Gosh, yeah. I mean, if I'm, if I'm, I mean, those, those are my favorite videos to make now because I get to be a bit more of a filmmaker. Like I, I don't mind sitting on a couch talking for 20 minutes, but that's me giving a talk. You know, it's, it, I don't get to be a filmmaker with that. Yeah. Um, whereas going and doing these little documentaries, I get to go and show off somebody else, which yeah. is cool, you know? And, it, and yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I, I choose the people that I want to make these films with quite carefully because I want to make sure that, that I stand by who they are and why you should pay attention to them. Like it, it's kind of on me that, that I have to select carefully. But once I've chosen somebody and think like, this would be a good person to do. And look, you know, I might get it wrong one day. I don't feel like I have yet, but I might get it wrong one day. Uh, then, then it's my job just to go and let them be themselves. And yes, like they're going to, wh where I do put my stamp on it is they're going to give me an hour to two hours of talking that I need to cut down to 15 minutes. So I'm choosing what I think are the important things for you to know. So, so I'm aware that I might be selecting things that really resonate with me. But I also think that if they resonate with me, they'll also resonate to the people I've attracted to my channel because that's why they're here. So I feel like that's okay to do. But no, I'm not, I'm not trying to guide them. And I, I, I'm very careful with the questions as well. Like I don't want to lead people with questions. So what I always do is, and there's a filmmaker's technique you use. You don't ask a question. You don't go... Um, so what camera do you use and why? And they go, oh, Canon's because, because you can't cut on Canon's because as the start of a, I want them to, I, you never hear me ask a question in one of those films. Mm -hmm. They just talk in a monologue. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll say like, tell me about, and I never ask about gear, but it, just as an example, like tell, tell me about what you use and why, talk to me about cameras, what sort of role they play. And, 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 and I'm just getting them to, to start the conversation going, well, you know, I, I, I kind of use these. Now I can start on that because it feels like it might be a cutting off point from what they've just said and they're just changing gears a little bit. So it's, it's leaving it as open-ended as, as possible. So like I've recently done one with uh, Ben Burford who shoots with um, dogs down in Wales. He's just dog walking, makes, does the most amazing sort of strobe natural light photography, really kind of hyper, hyper real stuff. It's cool. And with dogs as well, that's just... yeah. I mean, it's super easy. I just, I go to his house. He's, 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 you know, I'm going to drive down to Wales. I get there, stay overnight in the hotel, go through to his place the next day. And we set up in his lounge where he's comfortable. It's his space. I can tell he's uncomfortable. He doesn't want to be on camera. I'm exactly the same. I don't like it. And I've been doing it for a long time. So I'll set the lights up and set the cameras up. And I'm already talking to him while we're doing that. And by the time we sit, we, I sort of sit down, I'm going, I'm just going to, I'm just going to start. We can just keep going if that's cool. I've got a little list next to me on a pad going like, this is stuff I want to get. And I'm going like, so how did you like, what's the kind of journey for you? Like, how did this all start? And he'll, he'll go, oh yeah, well, I, you know, I started, you know, I was doing this job and then I didn't, it's, it's a, it feels conversational as he starts. Cause it is a conversation between the two of us. It's just, I'm pulling myself out of it when I edit it entirely and cutting together the most interesting stuff he says. And then, yeah, it's all them, isn't it? Like I'm not imposing myself because you don't know I'm in the room when you're watching that, hopefully. You're not thinking about me being in the room. You're just listening to somebody as if you're in their lounge having a conversation with them. So yeah, yeah. The, the go I'm messing up if I'm putting any of myself on that or shaping it too much. It's got to be all them. And it makes it more interesting if it's all them. The whole point in doing videos with other photographers is it keeps my channel very varied and interested. If it, interesting, if I sit and I talk in every video about my opinion about everything, I mean I'm bored. Do you know what I mean? Like I've got, I've got to, I've got to get in other opinions and other points of view that differ from mine and disagree with mine, because you'll know that you might be surprised by something I put out on a channel. And you in the podcast world, you get that. 
because you live off that. But I think YouTubers often forget that. They try and make it all about their personality, their point of view only. And I, I'm not interesting enough for you not to get bored after five years of just listening to me rattle on. Yeah. So I'm actually kind of being strategic with it too. I think this, it makes my channel far more interesting if I include other voices. Yeah, and I suppose it also gives you that kind of, you know, because, you know, however you've discovered that person, right, whether it be social media, whether it be recommendation, whatever it might be, you're also getting that personal sense of, um, you know, finding out about that person and, and what they're like we are now, yeah, right? We, we, we will see you in a different light almost. It's not just Sean Tucker, this YouTube and photographer. We're going to know you a little bit more personally, right? So that motivates us to do other things. And I, th I think that's an important thing to acknowledge as well. Like, not only are you producing a great film about someone else, but you're inspiring someone else to discover them and find their own path, whatever that might be. And it's kind of like uh, you're giving a platform to these other people. And it is something that I wondered, like, you know, whether or not it means anything. You have reached, you know, half a million people on YouTube. So when you feature somebody like Tiffany, who isn't as big, you kind of obviously you're sending people her way and is is that something that you kind of always wanted to do when you kind of reached a certain level or is it just something that's kind of occurred more recently i mean i i just i know it's a byproduct like it's it's great that it's a byproduct the fact mm -hmm. that i get to show off on someone else's behalf and i always say this to them as well i say don't sell yourself in this like don't don't tell me about your book. Don't tell me about how brilliant you are because of this. Let me do that. So that's why I do those little intros for those videos so I can do that for them because I'm only making the film with them because I already like what they do. So, and if it comes from me, it's better than them saying it about themselves. So I will sell their book at the beginning or the end. I'll tell you why I think they're great photographers or what they mean to me and let them just tell their story. And yeah, the fact that that means that people go through afterwards and follow them and keep up with what they're doing is lovely. I, I absolutely love it. And I always, as far as possible, I'm trying to find people who are smaller names, who aren't these like juggernauts. You know, I mean, I probably probably could get some, some decent names now, like with where I'm at on YouTube. I could probably go after some big guns and, and, and some of them would say yes, potentially. But I'm less interested in that because those people have already been interviewed a thousand times. Yeah. You know their story and I don't have anything new to add, but if I can find somebody you don't know about and, and let them tell their story and you haven't heard that and I'm the first one to get that, I love that. Like, that's great for me. It's great for my channel and hopefully it's great for them because they get a bunch of new people coming across. Yeah. Well, that's why we nearly turned you down when you were begging to be on this. But um, I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was but, so no. desperate, man. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we did the exact same. Like we we've always said, like, and I know we don't have a huge following, and it's not about that, right? It's about yeah. connecting with people and and you know, we get messages like we actually put something out on Instagram today, or I did on Instagram today saying a little bit about us. Um because we had so many new followings in a, in a short amount of time, I guess, not, not mm -hmm. for us, I'm talking like 50 or 60 new followers in the, in the last couple of days, which, which yeah. is cool. Right. But a few people have message and um, we're like, I oh, you know really cool that you're talking to these people or, you know, it's really cool what you're doing. Um, fan, fanning out a little bit. And mm -hmm. I, I read that and, you know, I've, I've never, I said to Luke a couple of weeks ago, I was like, I've got no desire to be in the, you know, famous in any way, shape or form, right? Yeah, I wouldn't want to be in the spotlight. And I reply to him, I'm just, I reply to these people, and I'm, first of all, thank you. Do you know what I mean? It's mm. awesome that you're reaching out. Um, but secondly, we are just two guys that happen to like photography and we're trying to do something that will help the community. That's our, that's kind of our goal, right? Mm. But you shouldn't have to fan out and, you know, get weirded out by talking to people. You should try and see like a learning thing in everything you do. Um, mm. And that's why, you know, maybe we're not at that point where we can go after huge people. I mean, you, you were lucky enough to come on the podcast, which is we're very grateful for, but we want to talk to everyone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, we want yeah. to talk to anyone and everyone, not because we're desperate for people because we're fortunately at a point now where we can kind of reach out and get a response, but we, we've, we've discovered people that were just like, they're awesome. Let's, let's ask if they want to come on a podcast episode and talk. Like we don't know anything about them. I, they could have no followings or, Four million. It does not matter. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's, I think that's a really important message to kind of get across. It doesn't mm. just because you've got a big following that doesn't mean you're 
better or worse than someone doesn't did. necessarily make you more interesting at all yeah exactly yeah exactly that. and do you know what one of the, i've got a new favorite photographer at the moment you know you kind of go through stages of discovering mm. people follow him um who's oh, what's his name who's the guy that you did the video with where you both did the big print in london um, um samuel sam samuel yeah. his brother his brother mm. i'm pretty sure it's his brother because yeah. he was in his recent video yeah. he's a fantastic photographer cool. i can't stop looking at his work now and he's yeah. you know I don't know anything about him. I don't know anything about him. But I've mm. started following him and I really like his photos. That mm. is about as far as I've got. But I'm enjoying it. And it just makes you think about how you discover people, how you come across people. But yeah, well, probably through your video, I found someone else and I now like his brother's work. It's yeah. How it happens, isn't it? Great. Yeah. He did a video of like him walking around for like half an hour in Tokyo or something it was like years and years ago I work for myself now but when I used to work in an office I was the first one in and I used to put that on every morning mm. it was so calm and peaceful and like just watching two people chat and like kind of talk about nothing and yeah uh, that's yeah that's how I found him just randomly trying to find something like that that was quite meditative to watch before like lots of people started arriving in an office and things but yeah he's like fantastic um a really funny guy i do like yeah. his work a lot um yeah. we I, I noticed that recently uh you're posting some portraits of people like street portraiture that was on film as well mm. um which i know it like the whole medium kind of debate and everything is really like unimportant but i did find it quite interesting to see that you were sharing some work on film because you don't do like a whole lot of that um and one of the people you took a portrait of was like christian who's one of the ambassadors for what we're what we're doing mm -hmm. um but i just wondered is that like uh was there was there any particular reason why you kind of started picking up that camera again or uh wanted to start sharing that work again maybe you were doing it privately just before you answer that we know you are very much into your analog photography as well to the point where I could probably tell you second by second of your development tutorial video. <laughs> myself and Luke will go through that and I might text them going, which part of the video does it tell you how to do the yeah. bath for argument's sake? And it's all yeah. of that video. Or, or, the, or the Matt Day one, I think, which you actually talk about in that video. But oh yeah, he's, he's the granddaddy, man. He's yeah. yeah, he knows what he's doing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a big film photographer at all. I, I think I just, and I haven't shot film for a little while. Those are older portraits now from before lockdown. Um, but I think it's, it's just another, it's just another thing, isn't it? It's something else to try, like uh, that maybe it shakes something loose. I'm definitely not one of these films, the best digital's evil mm. or vice versa. I really don't have any time for those conversations. I think if you're on one end or the other of that argument, saying one's more pure or one's more beautiful, you, you've missed the point of photography. Like you should be able to take a great photograph with whatever camera you have and trying to suggest that film imbues your image with more soul is like, makes me want to gag, to be honest. It's like, like, well, I've seen incredible images on digital that make me want to weep. And I've seen a lot of crap on film. Like it, it has to be a good photograph full stop. Uh, and you can do it with any camera if, if you know what you're doing. Um, but that said, I love the process. Like it's, it's yeah. it's there's something different about it obviously you, you you the way that you shoot is different the fact that you have to develop differently even how you expose is going to be different um i'm not somebody who is one of these embrace the grain kind of people like the grainier the better because honestly i still like a sharp detailed image so i tend to shoot faster films like um black and white i'm a big fan of the foma pan 100 i'll shoot like uh ilford delta is a nice sort of clean film as well. So I still shoot quite clean films because I do like a clean image. I don't want to throw details away in the grain. Um, but yeah, that I do. I do enjoy the process. I like. I like that it's something different. But it's more like a, it's more a hobby for me. I never do. I'd never shoot like that for a client unless they specifically requested it. And if they did, I'd be quite nervous because I definitely don't have the control over film that I do on digital, and I'm, I, I don't have nearly the experience I do on on film as I do digital but yeah it's a fun I mean I've got like I mean I've got this little guy that I take out every now and again which is an old um Yashica uh I think it's an EM I mean it's this is supposed to have a, a light meter a light cell meter on the front which is as you can see it's just like a piece of metal now it's yeah. just been ripped off at some point but I bought it for 40 quid 
it's still light proof still takes good images i use my phone for the light meter and it's uh it's pretty cool it's fun to shoot with you know it's like it's a waist level viewfinder so you're looking down like composing is a nightmare because it all it's all backwards you know when you're trying to compose stuff it's yeah. it's like but it's fun and it, it gives you a different sort of image you, it gets kind of swirly at the edges and it's just a fun thing to do but yeah it's 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 definitely more a hobby and a fun thing than a than a job thing sometimes you might get the itch to to do to do something different to your normal day-to-day -day. yeah whether it be analog or digital or vice versa it does not matter do you know what i mean it, yeah. photography should be fun right i don't know how people do that um like i see people that do do professional work on film and there's there's two people i really like who i follow um, a guy called Adam Cole and a woman called Cara Perry, and they both do like fashion work and uh, and all on film. And mm -hmm. you know, it's particularly Cara Perry; she's got this real, quite a unique style, and it's very grainy. And sometimes you look at it and think, yeah, you could have taken a better photo. It's like it's not exposed correctly, um, but uh, like it, it has this absolutely like gorgeous look to everything she that's that's kind of what she's known for doing for you know what she's known for so i guess people come to her for that specific reason i think the dangerous thing is like a lot of photographers see film at the beginning of their journey and they go hang on a minute i don't have a lot of control of digital but if i go to film and it's super grainy and grungy then everyone will think it'll hide a lot of my mistakes and everyone will like the mood of it and they don't actually learn how to take a good photograph first and use that stuff on purpose instead of it's just accidental and they claim, oh, and, yeah. you know, images don't have to be sharp or it doesn't have to be in focus or it can be. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's true. As long as it's not an excuse for the fact that you can't take an image in focus or shoot a clean image or compose well. Like, don't use it as an excuse not to learn the fundamentals. Um, use it when you know how to take a good photograph to add mood, if you want to do that and know how to do that, like it sounds like that photographer is doing. Yeah. Just don't, yeah. don't let it be a crutch. You know? Yeah. It, it can kind of send you the opposite way as well. Like I can, I shot a roll of expired film and forgot it was expired in a <laughs> camera, like a little cheap camera that I'd bought off eBay that I wasn't um, very used to using. So I kind of hadn't put the settings properly. And when I got the roll of film back, I think there was one photo that I was like, it's all right but everything else it looked horrible and it almost just made me i was like why, why bother why ever take another photo ever again what a waste of time and um then you know i looked at the 17 rolls of film i've got in the fridge i'm like well okay they need to be used so don't use that film and that camera together again mm. i always think as well without kind of going into this argument but I understand if you're a purist film photographer, right? I understand if you only shoot digital. What annoys me is that if someone makes it, it if they have to go out of their way to tell you that you should be doing something different, mm. just don't look. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, I don't want you to look if your attitude is, mm. is that. Do you know what I mean? Just do your own thing. You, you do you, right? Yeah, I had, I had my first experience of that the other day, like of a proper, proper comment where it was like, yeah, like learn some lessons about like how to crop photos properly and um, all this stuff, which immediately I was like, well, like because I shouldn't prop photos, I should, uh, I should just post, you know, the image as it was taken. That was kind of the argument. And I was like, well, you don't know if I've cropped these photos or not because they're on Instagram. So how would you ever know? Um, and like immediately you just kind of like, brush it to one side and then they blocked me anyway so I couldn't like couldn't think about it too much but yeah it's quite a bizarre kind of like gatekeeping attitude that it's it's an insecure photographer who's upset you took a better image than they did they need to bring it down I mean that that cropping argument is ridiculous I made a video about like is photoshop evil a while ago mm. and the first thing I hit in that video I hit a bunch of stuff like and the first thing I hit in that video is cropping. And they go, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Since Photoshop, everyone crops their images. I'm like, everyone was always cropping their images. And I show two images. And one is um, a very famous image by Elliot Erwitt, who was doing this project on dogs. Uh, and there's a, there's a little chihuahua on a lead and just this lady's ankles on the street. And when you look at the original image, he's cropped that image so heavily. He's probably only using about 30% of the actual image that he took. It's that heavy a crop. It's like, well, yeah, but film photographers would never do that. Well, Elliot Erwitt did it all the time. So what are you talking about? Yeah. And there's another one of um, Arnold Newman's portrait of uh, Igor Stravinsky at the piano. 
yes. took this great portrait of him sitting behind the piano and obviously thought later, wow, this could be a much cleaner frame if I just sort of crop this around the piano and line everything up. So it's just like shapes. And he, he cropped it really heavily. This is all in the film here. It was always, always happening. Retouching was always happening. Was it, you got retouchers kits for film photographs that you, you would scratch away on glass plates or actually paint stuff in on prints. Like retouching was always a thing. Everything has always been there. This kind of, this kind of idea of, if you want to get it in camera and that's your process, good for you. I mean, it's brilliant. That's your process though, but don't hate people whose process is I'm going to collect a, a neutral starting point and then finish it in, in, in post. That doesn't make you better or worse. In, and in fact, if you think it does, side by side your images and don't tell people what the process was and see whose image they like better. Because the, the only thing I always say to photographers is don't lie about what you did. Don't ever say to somebody, I never edit my photos and you do, because that's an integrity issue. Mm -hmm. Like if someone asks me, how much editing do I do on my street photos that I post on Instagram? I'll tell them like I, I tweak colors and I might give a little bit of a crop, but that's as far as I go. And when it comes to my portraits, no, I do about 45 minutes work per image because it's a full retouch. That's how much editing I do. I don't pretend that I take a portrait and that's just how they look out of the raw file because that would be a lie. Yeah, so as yeah. long as I tell you what my, I don't have to tell you exactly what I do, but as long as I'm honest about my process, I really don't care how people get to their images. Give me good stuff. And it, it reminds me of one image I took. And Luke, you were actually with me. You were, we were making a video and Luke just happened to be recording me my back was against the wall. I was looking towards the camera. And in my peripheral really vision, I saw this guy walking past and he had like this trilby hat on, a cane, short ankle basher trousers, but not through design and bright yellow socks. And do you remember I, I ran? Yeah, yeah. So surely that makes me a better photographer to wanting to capture something that I've seen of interest and doing the best I can with the time that I had to do so. And then Edit, editing, you know, cropping or editing that photo, how I cho chose to edit that photo to demonstrate what I saw is better that I've took that photo and maybe I haven't got the ideal shot because I haven't stopped him to ask if I can take a photo of his socks, but I've taken the photo, do you know what I mean? And if I've cropped it, that's my choice. I mean, I, show me a good photograph. I couldn't care less how you got there. In fact, I'm not even that interested. Just yeah. show me something I haven't seen before. I'm not sure where the obsession with how people took an image comes from, but it's everyone asks, at least one person will ask in every photo I take. Like I took an image that's coming out in collection five. That's, that's like a, it's a Fox standing in front of um, an orange, like yeah. VW bug bus. One of these like, things It was just around the corner from me in Wandsworth. It was literally 50 meters from my house. And I saw it on the way to the shops. The number of people who wouldn't believe that was a real photograph you used a taxidermy Fox. You photoshopped in the Fox. You changed the color of the bus to match the Fox. I'm like, I didn't, but if I did, who cares? But like, you're obsessed. You have to know, don't you? The mm -hmm. fact is, no, that is the shot. All I did was dodge the fox up a little bit so it's a little bit brighter because it was a little bit darker in the shadows. That's the only kind of edit edit I did to that photograph. But they were obsessed with working out because it's almost like if it's that good, we don't believe you got it in camera. Yeah. We don't believe that was the shot you took and we're looking for a lie somewhere. And when I tell you, no, it's not, you still don't believe me because it's kind of a compliment. It's like, we don't believe you could possibly take a photograph that amazing. Well, I kind of did. That, that is the yeah. photograph I took. There's no magic to it. I just got really lucky on the way to the shops one day. But what, but what I don't get is what's wrong with trying to make something that's got your name on it mm. the best it can look. Do you know what I mean? Like, well, nothing for me. You don't need yeah. the house if you've got a bit of ketchup on your cheek. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You just go clean it up. So if that's how you envision going out of the house, then you're going to go clean it and touch it up. Do you know what I mean? I just, I just think it's a, a personal thing. Like, surely it's better to take the photo than it is not take the photo and say, I didn't take it because I would have had to cop it. It's just yeah. a, a ridiculous statement. There was a whole thing about leaving the borders on your negative scans as well to prove <laughs> that you didn't crop. Because I was like, yeah. you are a better person than me then if that's what you're doing because, yeah. wow. I think like the first time I ever developed a roll of film, found it hard when I'd scan them in to, to crop them and to, to straighten them out and to lose the edge of the picture. Cause like, as soon as I've done that, it could just be a digital scan. Like it, it could just be a digital photo. So I kind of wanted to leave it in and I've still got them. And I, I saw them the other day and was like, I mean, these are bad photos anyway. So like I, I never shared them or anything. I think, I think I developed them very well. I definitely didn't scan them very well. But um, 
and then when I looked, I was like, why? Why did I think that would be an interesting thing to do? And this was a couple of years ago, but and has since been proven by the kind of film bros of uh, Instagram who like go around spouting that kind of stuff. So mm. feel like justified. There was one thing in the book that you talked about uh, the meaning of the word religion and like essentially like ligaire, re ligaire, which I thought was really interesting that resonated with me quite a lot as well. Like my granddad was a priest and I didn't mm. really know like a lot about him until he died and I was at his funeral and loads of people told me about like, he was a missionary and he was a, um, he was a conscientious, conscientious objector. He went to the prison in the, like in Wandsworth prison because mm. he was like, refused to go and fight. He said like, I'll, I'll do like the women's work, but I won't, um, and that, so he went to prison for a few months, like at the beginning of the war and all this like crazy stuff, which um, I, you know, like watched your video again recently where you were interviewing your granddad. And I thought, wow, like, I wish I'd been able to like have those conversations. Like, I don't know why you would never tell like your grandchildren about this cool stuff that you did, particularly with the conscientious objection stuff. So it's, it's kind of like it's an odd uh, relationship with religion and stuff like that. And I'm not a religious person at all, even though we were kind of like raised slightly like that because of my granddad. But then like reading that meaning of the word mm. religion to like to connect and to reconnect with people and um you doing that through photography that really struck a chord that uh, little section that religion section for me was because I, I got really frustrated with <clears throat> I mean I, obviously like I worked for the church for years but it's I think in the minds of a lot of people religion's a very specific thing you know it's that uh, it's that big building where you go and they do weird stuff and say weird things and you kind of feel like you're joining a cult but the, the word is more interesting than that because if you if you kind of look at and this is only one of the suggested etymologies there's a few but one is that it comes from that Latin ligare, which which means to join things together, like li like a ligament, re ligare. So it's joining things back together, then pulled apart. And there's this idea, especially in the Jewish tradition, that you know when you say when you say shalom to somebody, you've got this kind of idea of meaning peace. You know that's how you sort of greeting each other in that Jewish tradition. But the word itself is a lot broader than that. It kind of means the right standing of all things everything in its right place that's kind of what it means so if you think about the fact that the world in as a whole everything in its right place should be things like we should be taking care of the environment we should be taking care of each other we shouldn't be at war with each other we should be working together to make everybody's lives better we should be reconnecting broken things and so the way that i talk about it in the book is like the meaning that you find in the things that you make is often to do with taking something that you love doing and making the world a slightly better place. If you can find a way to do that, you'll never have to think about meaning in your work again. And so the trick is to look around you for broken things and work out how to point that thing you love at something that's broken to reconnect something, which is the work of good religion. I think a lot of them have just forgotten it and they've gone into like building themselves a clubhouse for their group and closing the doors instead of like, we're supposed to be here to make the world a better place. And it's about people and it's about the planet and it's about nations working together. It's about, you know, reconnecting with people in your life. It's about reconnecting people with themselves when they've lost touch with themselves or lost hope. It's all that stuff. Could you find a way to do that with a camera? Like I know lots of photographers who have, I use examples in the book, like uh, Martin Osborne's work with the Galgos, uh, the Spanish greyhounds, Salgado's work with refugees and workers around the planet, Tish Murtha's work, with people in poverty in their late 70s, early 80s and in Newcastle. Like these are people who looked around and went, hang on a minute, the world's a broken place in this way. And maybe I could rejoin broken things back together with this camera I've got in my hand. Like that's a, that's a long term goal for everybody. For me, I'm still trying to work out how to do that. But those people who found that stuff never have sleepless nights about does their work have meaning? Mm -hmm. They're clear about what the meaning is in their work. They might be frustrated. It's not, they're not making changes fast enough, but not for a minute are they going, oh gosh, I w wish my work had meaning. It's the rest of us who are chasing social media fame and all that fluffy stuff. We're worried about the meaning in our work because it's self-centered and it's about us. So I reckon that's, that's kind of why I use that example. Uh, you want me to read this benediction? Well, yeah, if you would be happy to, it was yeah. definitely... Um... 
This is for the podcast, by the way, Sean. This is just for Luke to listen to a bit later on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Bedtime, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll read your story, Luke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. I. Um, he always said, I'd love Sean to read me a good night story and put me to sleep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not, I'm not forking out for the audio book as well as the. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just a great, it's a great ending to the book, and it really like it resonated when I read it, and and as I had, you know, I had to go back and reread it, and just thought that might be quite a cool thing to do. Yeah, I mean, just for people who are listening, like this is just kind of me summing up what I've been through in the book. So some of this, like obviously, I go into in quite a lot of depth, but you'll get, you'll get the idea. It's just a short ending to the book. It says, um, this is this final chapter called Benediction. If you'd found yourself years ago sitting and listening to me wrap up a talk in a church, I would have ended with a benediction of sorts. In the original Latin, bene just means well, and diction comes from the Latin dicere, which just means say. So if done right, a benediction isn't just an empty ritual, but rather a speaker wishing the listeners well after they've spent some time talking about important things. In some older traditions, a benediction takes the form of a series of may you statements in an effort to make the message personal to you. So as we close our time together, I'm going to use that simple ancient formula to send you on your way with some good words, some well wishes, and if you'll allow me, maybe even a blessing. So my fellow maker, may you join with the billions of creative human voices throughout history and attempt to pull order from chaos in the small ways you can manage. May you find ways to tell the capital T truth and to fill your work with logos. May you make a habit of taking deep creative in-breaths by carving out generative mental space in order to hear the quiet voices of the muses. May you take the challenge to become an autodidact and build a curriculum of creative voices for yourself which will inflame your imagination. May you continue to fearlessly face yourself and the journey you've been on and to roll as much of your story into your work as you're willing so that your unique creative voice can emerge. May you learn to dance well with your ego and use it to give you the confidence and tenacity to make the things you believe in. May you let go of your need to control how your work is received and choose instead to focus simply on doing the very best work you can. May you find the courage to release what you make into the world where it has the chance to bring comfort and joy to others. May you find the strength to face your own neediness and drive for approval so that your motivation to make is never tied to the acceptance you receive. May you learn to recognize the specter of creative envy when it rears its ugly head. And may you practice generosity with your compliments and free yourself from the imagined competition. May you learn to tune out the general noise of responses to your work and look instead for feedback from informed and caring commentators. May you have the modesty to accept compliments with grace and the humility to learn even from the most pointed criticisms if they come from trusted sources. May you invest in relationships and find artists you can both learn from and journey with as you push each other to become the best versions of yourselves. May you find a mentor you respect who can be your guide and may you never forget to turn around and offer the same to others. May you come to trust your feelings and believe that they will lead you toward new avenues of expression and may you find a balance with your rational mind so that there is stability and consistency in your making. May you embrace your shadows, both those that surface within you and those you pass through, and may you fold them into the things you make in order to present us with a richer, more nuanced view of life. May you protect your highlights and remember to celebrate your growth as an artist and accept yourself as fundamentally good. May your work ultimately point us toward the light. May you discover your deep joy by paying attention to those creative pursuits and subjects that compel you and use them as compass bearings to explore as you travel onward. May you find ways to point your deep joy at the world's deep hunger so as to remake broken connections with the things you make. May you learn to be patient with yourself and set your sights on the long road ahead, understanding that building anything worthwhile takes time. May you find ever more meaning in your making.